Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the warm welcome. And thank you for bringing me to Copenhagen. Uh, what a fantastic city. But I'm not going to talk about Hope Copenhagen today. I'm going to tell you about a different favorite city of mine, which is Dallas, Texas. Now, those of you who may know Dallas, Texas might find that a strange choice for a favorite city. But there's actually a simple reason why I'm so fond of Dallas, and I'm going to show you that reason right now. This is the Renaissance Tower in Dallas. And the reason I'm showing you this is because for many years, this was the headquarters of the Blockbuster Corporation. <laughs> and more importantly, in the year 2000, a very interesting meeting took place there. Now, in 2000, Netflix was very different than the company you might know today. We were very small. We were about two and a half years old. We had less than 100 employees, and we were on track to perhaps do $3 million that year. But unfortunately, we were also on track to lose a cumulative $50 million. And being prudent entrepreneurs, we decided at that point it was time to seek strategic alternatives. And the obvious strategic alternative was Blockbuster. But in 2000, they were on a very different trajectory. So we were on track to do three million. Blockbuster was on track to do six billion dollars. We had 100 employees. They had 60,000 employees. They had 9,000 stores. And so when we tried to call them up to get a meeting, they wouldn't even take our calls. They wouldn't answer our emails. Until finally, after a bunch of pounding on the door, they said that we will see you now. And we flew to Dallas. We went up to the 27th floor of this building. We were ushered into a conference room which seemed to be about the size of this room. All the blockbuster guys came in in their very expensive suits, and we were there in our Silicon Valley t-shirts and jeans. And we all sat down to pitch. And we said, it's great. We will do the online business. You'll do the stores. We'll have synergy. Won't that be great? And they shook their heads in the right place. And then they asked the big question, how much should we pay for you? And my partner, Reed, uh, screwed up his courage and he said, f f $50 million? And that's exactly the rea reaction that they had. <laughs> so the meeting went downhill very quickly after that. And it was a long, quiet ride on the plane back home to California. And I remember so distinctly sitting there quietly, just thinking, oh, now we're going to have to kick their ass. <laughs> what it says is that you never know where the people who take you down are going to come from. They probably look nothing like you. And what it really says is that if you don't learn how to disrupt yourself, well, that someone's going to come and disrupt you for you. Now, Netflix, of course, was a disruptive story, but Netflix was just one of seven startups that I was responsible for. And since leaving Netflix more than 10 years ago, I've had a chance to work with scores of other early stage companies and hundreds of entrepreneurs. And I've learned that there really is only two important ingredients to disruption and innovation. Two things. First, you need a tolerance for risk. Risk taking is fundamental to every new venture. But I don't mean scary, dangerous risk like the picture. I just mean the risk that comes from starting down a path where you don't know where it's going to lead. But you also need ideas. You need this capacity to generate ideas. Because the one idea that you start with is never going to be the idea you finish with. You need 10, you need 100, you're going to need 1,000 ideas. But the thing is, you have to look for ideas. Because ideas do not spring out of thin air in some mythical eureka moment. The idea for Netflix, for example, did not come from some momentary anguish on a late fee on a movie. We were looking for that idea. It was buried in a big pile of bad ideas. On April 14th, 1998, we launched Netflix. Now, the Netflix back then is nothing like the Netflix that you know today. To start, no streaming, 
DVD only. Number two, not a tremendous amount of innovation. There was due dates, there was late fees. The only real innovation was that it was by mail. And most interestingly, we didn't just rent DVDs, we sold DVDs. In fact, we sold a lot of DVDs. So many that by the end of our first summer, the good news was our first $100,000 month. The bad news, 99% of it was selling DVDs. And this was bad because we knew it was a commodity business, that pretty soon the margins would go to zero and we'd be out of business. But rental, that was even worse because we couldn't get anyone to do it. And worst of all, doing both at the same time was brutally difficult. We said we've got to pick one and focus on it. But which one? Selling, which is going to go out of business eventually but is paying the bills? Or rental, which might work but is showing no promise whatsoever? So obviously you know the answer. We walked away from selling and bet everything on making rental work. And from that point on, we were so focused on figuring this out that we tried everything we could think of. Buy one, rent one, get one free. We did promotions. We did all kinds of discounting. And I'm kind of a perfectionist. So when we first began running these tests, they'd be perfect. All the spelling, perfect art direction, every single link tested, every single bit of that process. And it would take us about a month. And we'd launch the test, and it would fail. And we'd say, oh, we just lost a month. We've got to go faster. So then, we'd try and do the test in two weeks. And then it would fail. And now we've wasted two weeks. Okay, faster, a week. Okay, a day. Okay, two tests in the same day. And as you can imagine, these tests are getting worse and worse. They're getting crappier and crappier. We're having broken links and misspellings and the wrong images and we're crashing the site. But what was amazing is that we learned if it was a bad idea, that no matter how much we polished the idea, it still didn't work. But if it was a good idea, then even terribly implemented, it immediately worked. People would fight through a crash site to do it. They'd click trying to find a way to make this happen. And then we knew what to fix. We learned probably one of our most important lessons. We learned it wasn't about having good ideas. It was about building a system to try lots of bad ones. And that's why I'm not a believer in the big idea. Because the big idea doesn't count. It probably isn't going to work. It's the next one you try, and the next one you try, and the next one you try. And we tried hundreds of ideas, 99% of them bad ones. How did you come up with the name Netflix, which should be Netflix tonight? Everybody knows the name now. It's almost like Apple. So do you want the Mark is a genius version or the Mark is lucky version? Let's do the overflow champagne stuff. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the problem with, with this idea of doing DVDs by mail is that it was obvious to everybody that eventually no one was going to use DVDs anymore. It's a digital medium. They're just going to stream it or download it. But everyone thought it's going to be tomorrow. And the challenge is, how do you build a company which will work for DVDs now, but yet when the world transitions to streaming, you're still relevant? And if we had said we are going to be the world's best shipper of plastic, we would be dead. If we had said we're the world's best streamer, back then we'd be dead. So instead, we positioned ourselves as the world's best place to find movies you love. And that, and that works because it's delivery agnostic. In other words, we don't care whether you want it on DVD or streamed or in 10 years beamed into your fillings. We can do it. And that's kind of why Netflix was there, because it worked in the past. And I think it'll also work pretty far out into the future. You've been an entrepreneur for more than four decades, and you, you more or less mentioned a bit about this in your presentation, but what would you say is the key, key learning when it comes to a disruptive idea like the one you did with Netflix? Uh, what's the key learning? I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the, the key learning is you have to do something. Uh, too many people have these disruptive ideas in their head, and they have a hundred reasons why they shouldn't start. And every disruption 
starts by seeming completely irrational. I mean, it's crazy, uh, and, and which makes sense. If it wasn't crazy, some would have done it already. But someone has to say, let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. And almost every big innovation starts that way. <coughs> Pardon me. Which is why large, uh, large companies sometimes have a hard time getting started. They have a very stable business, and they don't want to rock the boat at all. Whereas small companies don't have that risk. They can move faster. They can take more chances. As you mentioned, you're not afraid of failure. But I'm just wondering, what would you say has been your biggest failure, and what did it teach you? See, you know, I, I don't think I have any single big failures that I'd point to. Uh, I have a collection of several thousand small failures. <laughs> that counts too. It does. <laughs> and, you know, I think one of the skills is being able to take small incremental risks, especially now. When we started Netflix, you know, I, I said it took us six months just to build a website. And so the risk we took then was substantial. It was six months of my life, six months of my employees' lives, several million dollars. But today, that risk could be taken over a weekend. It could be taken for $100, which just totally opens up the ability to try things. This is the golden age of uh, disruption, innovation, and entrepreneurship.